From Shroud University, this is Russ Brial bringing you another discussion on the Shroud of Turin, the greatest mystery of the known world. We are back with Isabel Pixek uh, and myself, Russ Brial, with Shroud University and um, our video blog here. And as we said before the break, Isabel Pixek is a world-renowned artist, and we're discussing all things related to the Shroud and why it could or could not be the work of an artist. Um, uh, because that is the alternative. What we have here it either is the authentic burial shroud of Jesus or it's not. And if it's not, then what is it? So um, now there's a, there's a theory out there that's been popularized. Um, and, and this, I think, gets some genesis uh, from the belief that the Shroud is medieval, um, and uh, which, uh, you know, has... You know, I, I'll, I'll acknowledge that it has been that that medieval date has been supported with carbon dating. That's that's a problem, and there are other areas on Shroud University. You need to go to the School of Chemistry and look at the articles there that deal with carbon dating. And I don't. This this is not a discussion about that. But you need to know that that in in, in 2005, Ray Rogers, a uh, 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 chemist, uh, d took thread samples from the main body of the shroud, compared them chemically to thread samples taken from the corner, the one sample cut from the outside corner edge, and determined that they are not the same. Well, how in the world can this happen? How can you have thread samples from the same cloth and not be the same, chemically? Um, and, you, and so what we believe now is, is that uh, that corner that was cut for carbon-14 dating was probably uh, an area that was rewoven during the Middle Ages because that corner was handled hundreds of times, and uh, so. But you can read some about some of that on the on this on the School of Chemistry, and watch some of the videos that are that are there. Um, so the, suffice it to say, now carbon dating has been seriously called into into question, and you know. And since they violated the, the sampling protocol by taking only one sample instead of three, uh, you, know, you know, so if they have a bad sample, what are you going to do? How can you prove, you know, so they, they, they messed up. And um, so having said that, so since there is the, the general belief out there in the, in, the, in the world that the shroud is medieval, uh, then uh, there have been those uh, authors who have written books um, saying that the only artist capable to have produced something anywhere close to the Shroud of Turin was Leonardo the Da Vinci. But there's a problem. And the problem is that he wasn't born <laughs> when, the, when the Shroud was first appeared in France in 1356. In fact, he was born 100 years later, right? 100 years later, yes. So, so and, and I, I don't think that this theory su uh, suggests that he invented time travel. So, <laughs> so, so part of this Leonardo theory is that whatever was displayed in Luray, France, in 1356, that was just a crude idea. And Leonardo captured that idea. And whatever that was disappeared. And then Leonardo decided to do his own shroud almost as a self-portrait, if, 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 if you will. So... I, I wanted to have Isabel weigh in and discuss a little bit about Leonardo and his paint styles and techniques and, and whether or not it's even conceivable that the Shroud could be the work of Leonardo da Vinci. If I ever have seen anything which is inconceivable, that is the Leonardo da Vinci theory. Uh, somebody who says that doesn't know anything about the man Leonardo or his art. Forget it that he was born a hundred years later. That's a good argument, but we can use up much, much heavier arguments. Leonardo was a, an extremely hesitant artist, extremely slow. Maybe the slowest artist in the history of art. How his patr patrons put up with that, I don't know. Mine certainly wouldn't, <laughs> that I know from experience. But anyhow, he, that's why he was unable to paint murals, for instance, because to be a mural artist like I am, it takes a fast, very decisive person, because you only have hours to finish a, a fresco piece. And even if you paint with acrylics or some tempera, takes a lot of 
strength and fastness to, to finish. Uh, he, he spoiled one mural and wall after the other, the, the Last Supper within his lifetime started to disintegrate and he mixed all kinds of techniques, tempera with oil, watercolor, fresco, everything went uh, so on top of it. So he mixed all kinds of elements yes, together. Because and, and he just could not get himself to finish that painting. And now that it but you're saying that within his lifetime, the Last Supper began to disintegrate. To disintegrate, yes. Then forget the <laughs> Last Supper, it was still uh, fared much better, but the, the Battle of Anghiari, which he painted, was supposed to paint in the... The, uh, the Battle of Anghiari? Yes, okay. that was for the, for the Palazzo, uh, Florentine Palazzo for the uh, authorities. And one wall was given to Leonardo da Vinci, the other wall to, to Michelangelo. And they started at the same time. Boy, he needed that <laughs> because he, he looked up in, in uh, one of the old Greek uh, books, uh, technique, which was an oil paint. It suited his slowness better. And the, after the painting was done, you were supposed to ca carry huge bowls of, of, of bo boiling oil and put it underneath. And that was supposed to make the painting more permanent. First and above all, he only finished the small section, brought in the boiling oil, and the whole painting just, just went out. Yeah. <laughs> it just vanished. Yeah, just vanished. He was incapable of getting himself to paint fast. Now, to paint the, the uh, Shroud of Turin, even if it could be a painting, and I guarantee it could, couldn't be, it takes an artist who can paint what we call alla prima, not in coats, one coat. One coat. And you have to start on top and finish it on the bottom without lifting your finger. Wow. How could Leonardo da Vinci wow, do that? Wow, that's astonishing. How could, and, and it, it has, shows no layers. His uh, painting technique was layered, layer after layer. The Mona Lisa must have a thousand layers, one after the So it. you're saying Leonardo's technique was to have multiple, multiple layers. Multiple and layers. And what we see on the yes. shroud is a single, well, it's yeah. not really a layer. It's just you have each of these, when you get down to the microscope, you see that, that each, each fiber yes. of the linen is yeah. colored. Yes. And, yes. and so, we're, I mean, we're still trying to figure out how that worked. But whatever it is, if that's a layer, then there's only one layer. Oh, and, yes. and, and so the, uh, now, now you've, you, so, so really everything we know about the shroud is really contrary to Leonardo's style. Absolutely contrary. Another thing which is absolutely contrary, that he had this uh, notebook notebooks, a whole series of them, which he wrote from right to left, so that we, you could read it only with holding a mirror to it, okay. so that nobody could read what he wrote, wrote. But everything was entered into it. He bought some shoe, la shoe uh, laces, laces for, for his pupil, Salaino. It's very neatly written, it, I bought today shoelaces for Salaino, uh, one lira or something, whatever was the, the money at the time. So that, that he, he paints a painting like the shroud, and he doesn't enter one single word in his uh, little diary. So, there's, so in, in all of his very detailed documentation that yeah. he kept of everything else he that he never, did, there's yeah. no mention of, no of him mention, ever doing anything no like mention. that. Like then the all, his, all his creations, and he was a great scientist, there is no question about it, but all what he created, the airplane, all kinds of optical instruments, all kinds of war instruments, huge war instruments, none of them worked. So none, none of them. So none of them worked. Yeah. So he just had so ideas, but those are ideas that, that weren't really totally yes. fleshed out. They were so he he was this greatest of all artists because he was he was the greatest failure mankind ever knew. 
<laughs> he never finished and maybe the Mona Lisa is the only thing which he sort of finished and it's a well did he finish the last supper uh, it's an arguable point I I really don't think so because he already started to see the disintegration, the paint flaking off and things like that. Right. And he so was others so have had to come in and, and actually Well, maybe it. nobody would, would dare to touch it. He, it was left as he left it, but now that it underwent a thorough restoration, they found out that there were a whole bunch of plates and goblets and this and that, which he painted and then painted over. Oh. He was so hesitant. There is some, one of the apostles even had an extra hand because, because he, left, he abandoned the figure and then returned to it. And it and so which is what you were saying is that to be a successful mural painter, you have to be decisive. You can't, be, decisive. You, you can't keep changing yeah. your mind and coming back and, no. oh, I don't like that. No. And no. You have to know what you're doing and be decisive about it. No, he, he loved to abandon things. And none of the things which he created really worked. It's, it's, he was such a genius that he foretold to us that there will be a submarine. He foretold to us all kinds of cannons, very modern cannons, the, the flying machine, everything. But he himself could not do it. He just gave an idea. And so he was a, he, he was a, a visionary, a, but he, he, yes, wasn't, he wasn't very good yeah. at actually executing it. No, no. Okay. And, of course, later scientists returned to his work and studied it and studied it, and they lived out, out of him for centuries. They, they were able to execute what he just dreamt about. Okay. Now, you, in, you've showed some other, in some of your papers, and I don't know if it's this one or which one it is, but, but every artist uses a model yes. to paint on. If you're in, and so it's this, it's this, it goes back to this foreshortening thing that we talked about before the break. And, and the, the perspective that an artist would have to have in order to paint the man that we see pictured on the shroud. And in order to, in order to paint that perspective that we see, in the artist, you would have to be standing about how many feet above? About 15 to 17 feet. So in order to get that, that, that perspective of the man lying on the shroud, you'd have, to, you'd have to be up on a ladder about 15 to 17 feet above to get the perspective that we see on the shroud with, you know, with the shoulders drawn up and the legs drawn up. Yes. And, and, and the fact that there doesn't appear to be any light focus um, in, in a, at all. And, and, and so there, uh, you know, so the question is then, then how does one paint from 15 feet away? A, or a canvas which is 14 feet wide. <laughs> it's impossible. You know, People just don't picture the actual movements of the artist. He cannot, he only can make a small, very small painting, very small. And if you try to magnify it, as sometimes you do a small sketch and then you, you magnify it to actual size, it loses the detail. You don't see anymore what you see on the shroud. So it's impossible. You, you cannot stretch your arms. So and you, that's right. I remember you read, telling about this, that, that as you go closer to the image, it, like, like a, a, a typical painting, you lose detail. But yes. with the shroud, you gain detail in terms yes. of getting down into into the into the into the pixels and seeing how it how it's how it how it's how it's created in the blood stains and and so it really doesn't act like a painting. I mean, and that I have to correct. Okay. So, so many of my shroud colleagues get used to it. Maybe a scientist started to say that that because you have to back off and see the shroud from 15, 20 feet in order to really see it, that it's not like a painting. This is not a good argument because every painting you paint like that. The artist is like a runner. <laughs> there is the canvas, but you see from close, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. 
you have to run back and forth, back oh, right, and right, forth, back right. and I, forth. I see what you're saying. So, yes. so the fact that it doesn't look like much close up does, yeah, you know, that, it, that, that is not that's not really that. an argument that you would yeah, use no, from the standpoint no, of art no. because because any large artwork up close isn't going to look no. like anything. Exactly. You have to stand back to really yes, appreciate yes. the overall yes. artistic yes. piece. So, but I precisely see for the same reason, how can somebody standing 15 feet or 20 feet up in the air. You, you cannot even step out with your foot. I noticed that I had to put one foot over the other because my own foot would cover the model underneath. To get that identical yes. perspective per that we perspective. see on the yes. shroud. Yes. And then what makes things even doubly harder is the dorsal image because, yes. the, because here, the even there we see that the dorsal image is 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 somewhat longer uh, than the frontal image because yes. now you have because but the because the body's drawn up and so as you were saying in order to capture from an artistic standpoint to capture the dorsal side now this alleged model this whoever this person was who who volunteered for this you know then had to be kind of you know turn himself over in the exact same position he was when he was lying down on his back and, and now he's, he, and now his 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 weight is going to be where on his his, his like his nose no or? no man could do that I mean you, mean, no I mean, you wouldn't it's because, not like you just kind of yeah, lay down yeah, flat yeah, because what we yeah. see is the is the the dorsal image has has the same foreshortening characteristics as the frontal yes, image, yes. and and so it would be you know it would be you know virtually impossible uh, for completely that to occur. Completely impossible because he would have to balance himself on the tip of his nose, on the top of one hand only, and one knee. That's all. Now, now there are those that would say you know there are all kinds of again we get into these into these theories that well you know, maybe it was a Maybe it was a hot statue and some kind of a dust rubbing. What, what would you say about that? Oh, who, who in the Middle Ages could make a statue that realistic? There is no way. Plus, no matter how good the statue is, you still see that it's a statue. It's not a living person. And to heat a huge piece of bronze or whatever material, they, no way. You can't heat it like that. It would have to be so even that only the most modern, maybe electric system or something could Right, do. because what we see here is, is that the, the, the intensity of the image is identical from top yes. to bottom, yes. front to back. Yes. There's no difference in the intensity of the image, which, which suggests what, what you just said is that you'd almost need some kind of a piece of technology in order to have oh, a consistent yes. Heat, if in fact, no, infrared thermography would tell you that it, this image is not the result of heat because the image does yeah, not yeah. does not fluoresce the way that the burns that from yes. the fire in 1532, yes. those burns fluoresce, but the image does not. So, you know, so if heat was involved in the formation of the image, there wasn't there, there wasn't a lot of heat, and 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 so, but that heat had to be applied. Perfectly consistently over the the entire bronze sculpture, and of course, yeah. the problem. So that's a problem. But then the second problem is finding an artist who predated oh. Leonardo by a hundred years, who had the <laughs> ability to create such a lifelike. And in, we, we begin. We don't we don't get into lifelike images like that until the Renaissance. And uh, yeah, you know, right. so so here again, we now we come up with that event horizon thing. This, yes. this 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 kind of cultural historical barrier that you that yes. that you cannot assume that someone in the 1300s uh, knew of te or knew of knew of, of a technology that would occur you know 200 300 500 years later you just can't do it yes. and it's um, so so whatever theory we come up with has to fit within the cultural context of exactly. that artist yes plus there is another third thing that if you make a statue, even a heated statue, and you put a canvas on it and, and, and kind of go into all the cavities and the, the, uh, the raised parts and everything, and then you pull off the canvas, it's a wide, wide, stretched image, very ugly and, and 
completely out of Anatoly. Right, and so, so there's a horizontal so if you were to, expansion. So, so, so one of the, you know, if, if you were to take a cloth and just wrap it around a face and then stretch it like yeah. this, it would be all real rounded. Right. It would yeah, be, it would, it would be out, of, out of proportion. Yeah, a huge horizontal expansion. So, which, which gets us, which is kind of an interesting clue then as you know, so now we're back to Isabel saying, okay, this is not the work of an artist, so what is it? And so, you know, so naturally we're back to, is it possible that this is the burial shroud that wrapped the historical Jesus of Nazareth when he was in the tomb? I mean, that's the debate. If this was the shroud of Julius Caesar, we wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right, right, right now. And so yeah. it's, um, so the, uh, the, this, this, the, the, the fact that, that the shroud appears to have three-dimensionality to it or distance information, okay, yet at the same time, we know that, that, that just taking a cloth and wrapping it around a face would create a distortion, so, yes. which then tells you that the – now this, you know, on other places, on, on, on some of the writings that I've done, you'll, you'll, you'll know that I call the shroud the X-Files of Christianity. Which is you know it, you know because there there is some really strange things about this image, That's right. and and one of this is that 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 the that the image formation mechanism appears to be a vertical phenomenon perpendicular to the cloth, so it so it doesn't it would, it would is that right? Yes, no. The most modern oh, excuse me, the most modern investigation I'm conducting us as an even more complicated image. It's not even just up and down because the parts which uh, are concave and turn away from the perpendicular still register. And the mm. system of that is maddeningly complicated. So like the, the side of the nose is, or something. The shroud is so much more complicated than the any one of us, and even put together, realize. It, and it's, I, in my opinion, as a scientist, not just an, as an artist, as a scientist, I must say that no human being has that much brain to, yeah. to bring it forth. It's, it's, a, it's a divinely made item, and he really put us to the test to such a test that I admire what nerve God had <laughs> to expect us miserable little beings to, to understand what he did. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, I, you know, the, what you'll see as a consistent theme in Shroud University is that the Shroud is a fabulous mystery and it could very well be the most important archaeological artifact on the planet. Uh, and in the significance of the shroud is related to its potential. Because if the shroud is, in fact, the burial shroud of Jesus, and that image that's on there is the result of the resurrection, and the bloodstains is the result of crucifixion, I think you'd have to agree with me that that is that is enormous. And so the potential of the shroud is, is incredible, which is why people like myself and Isabel and other researchers continue to investigate it because it's too important to just flippantly say, oh, well, it's medieval fake. We know that. It was carbon dated to the Middle Ages. Well, you know, not so fast. <laughs> and it's you, know, you. Some of you might remember the news commentator Paul Harvey, and I always like to say, "Well, today I'm Paul Harvey, and you're going to hear the rest of the story." And that's what we're trying to tell on Shaw University: is that there's a lot to this story be beyond just the simple uh, soundbite from the evening news or, or an occasional documentary that you see that just hits the high points. There's a lot of there's a lot here, and so if you're a student and you're watching this. I encourage you to investigate the shroud. Find a way to incorporate the, 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 the shroud into a, a, maybe you have to do a paper, a project, a presentation, a speech, something related to history, art, chemistry. Find a way to incorporate the shroud into it. I think it'll give you a reason to investigate it, and uh, you'll find it 
fascinating. And um, so, Isabel, it has been wonderful to visit with you here in your studio. And um, is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we leave? Yes, very much so. I think that Russ Braut did a magnificent job explaining this shroud to people. He's unique in this, that he speaks to the young, especially, and we need young people to come to this research. God bless him for doing it and doing such a great job. Thank you, Isabel. I appreciate that. So, okay. Well, listen, stay tuned for the next uh, video blog. And this is also the audio of this is going to be on the uh, on uh, Shoutcast, which is, uh, which is a podcast that, that we do. And you can find that on iTunes. Just look for Shoutcast. And you can download it and listen to this. So, until next time, Russ Brial from Shroud University.